The question is, why is there so much um, persecution and violence in the name of religion perpetrated by people who say that they belong to certain religions in the world today? Because they're not religious. If they're truly religious as they claim, there cannot be any persecution at all. Because religions belong to God. And persecution cannot belong to God. So evidently the answer is, they're liars, they're not religious. Does religion um, ultimately cause more um, evil? Does, does it do more evil than good? Uh, my, uh, the answer to this question has already been given by me now, just now. Religion does not cause any evil. But it all depends. The name of your cult, the cult which you call religion, if religion springs from Allah <coughs> and can lead to Allah, then such religion can only create peace and love. It cannot create any evil. But if religion does not fulfill these two conditions, they say religions come from Allah. All persons who believe that our religion is true, they say it comes from Allah. But you can inquire back, does it lead to Allah as well? Now they will be caught. Because if they, it leads to Allah, then people who are godly people, they don't behave like they do. So their lies are caught by this second question. So whatever evil you observe, which seems to emanate from religion, does not seem from religion, but from irreligious people who only exploit the name of religion for their own advantages. Um, in Hazur's opinion, is it worthwhile to spend um, large sums of money to preserve animals which are going to be extinct? I think so. It's worthy. It's a very worthy expenditure of money which will be wasted otherwise. Because all the expenditures, apart from this, not all, but most of them, are wasteful. They're building arms, they're building weapons, they're building largely destructive weapons, like germ warfare things. So, to preserve animals is a very good thing, a very benign act on their part. But they should also think of preserving humans <laughs> against whom they are preparing to destroy them. There was a terrible plane crash a few years back in the, in the 70s in the Andes and um, the survivors of that crash were absolutely isolated from all you know, civilization. Only survived because um, some of the uh, companions who were going to die told them that we tell you to eat us so that you could stay alive. So it was, they, to eat them when they died, they gave them permission to eat their bodies to remain alive. So they survived by cannibalism, actually. That was a... How did you hear, Where did you hear it from? It's, it's well known. It's well known. I know this, yes. it's true. Um, they make a film of this yes. story. And they made a film of... Yes. Uh, yes. This, yes. this is a true incident. Yes. It actually occurred and some survivors reached civilization and uh, they kept it secret for a while but then ultimately it was disclosed that they had to eat uh, human flesh to survive. It's true. Hmm? What does Hazel think about this situation? Would it be permissible in such a situation? I think human flesh in such a situation if the person is already dead or dying is better than a swine's flesh, does it? Isn't it? Human flesh, when you have to save a life, is it not? Is is human flesh not better than the flesh of pigs? <laughs> no. You think pig's flesh is better than the human flesh? Huh? It's halal flesh. <laughs> <laughs>
Human flesh is halal? <laughs> you see, they are on two extremes. This is a point to be understood. Human flesh is the best flesh of all the animals. That is why when once the lion tastes of human blood and human flesh, it most often refuses to eat any other animal because it is extremely delicious. <laughs> so, it had to be, you know, hum humans are the very top of evolution, so their flesh has to be very fine. But at the same time, because Allah has protected it, not only by a, an order, but by an instinct, which is universal. In very few tribes you find cannibalism. I think they might have accidentally come across human flesh and because they began to like it, so they started it. But it's very rare. Cannibalism is very rare in the world. But human flesh is protected by the inner nature of man. Allah has created a horror for among the people to eat the blood of their kin, the flesh of their kin. But this is not the only protection provided to humanity. It is a protection which is provided to almost all forms of life. The dogs do not eat the flesh of dogs even if they are dying. The lions do not eat the flesh of lions even if they are dying. So this is how Allah works. In nature, they could not have been told by Sharia, don't eat each other's blood, but God has created a Sharia within people, a law within human nature and animal nature. So that is why human blood or any other blood, which is uh, to be protected by God, is forbidden. Now, when life is to be saved, then although human flesh should be as forbidden as other bloods, other fleshes are, at the time of uh, near death, but if a person has already died, then you can consume his blood or his flesh, not otherwise. Because the, then another rule takes over, which says that the living has a better right over the dead. So because in that situation it was the same thing. They started eating the flesh of the dead people. But because they had died among glaciers, among extremely low temperature, so the blood had not rotted. I mean, their, their flesh had not rotted. It was still edible. So this is a very rare thing to happen. And uh, if it happens, then as far as the law goes, it becomes permissible under such circumstances. But at the same time, when they return to civilization, in all their life they will be suffering of the thought of that, those moments when they had to eat the blood of their own friends and kith and kin. Got it? Which country has Huzur not yet um, visited but would like to visit and for, for which reason in particular would Huzur like to visit that country? You see, first of all, I think that uh, I have not been able to visit uh, China is one of the greatest countries of the world. And because as far as my remote uh, ancestors are concerned, they could be a Chinese because long ago the people of Tashkent, etc., you know these areas, they were Persian and uh, they also belonged to China at some stage. So the geography is not the same as we find today. 
because as the Muslim of the Islam was uh, mentioned as Ahli Faris, as Ibn Faris, son of Persia. So Persia in those days spread you know, all along this large area. So they went even into the territories of Chinese and they came back sometimes and pushed them back and so on. So Hazrat Musim al Islam has also mentioned that some of his grandmothers were from Chinese origin. See? So Persia I have seen, but not China as yet. <laughs> it would be a good thing to pay a visit to my ancestral country. But that's just a small thing, in fact. China in itself uh, is a big country, absolutely fantastic, in the sense particularly that it, is, it has the oldest uh, uh, civilization continuously living in the world. We have many civilizations which came and went like Roman civilization, Greek civilization, this and that. But we do not have, we do not find a continuity among them. In America there are Maya cultures and so on. But there is no continuity which continues to develop till today. China has this distinction their sciences, their knowledge, their culture, everything continued to evolve without a break. So as such, it is a very interesting study which one should undertake to go there and discuss and see the reasons why it happened there and uh, what effect it has left on their ultimately developed or mixed culture.